then it's my pleasure to introduce David, who will be telling us a little bit about approximating polynomial optimizations. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to today to convey the, uh, a specific method to approximate polynomial optimization problems. So my, my emphasis will be that this is a, a very general method that can be applied to many polynomial optimization problems and I also try to convince you that polynomial optimization problems are quite common because polynomials are a very common way to model problems in all kinds of science or life. So, so my emphasis will be on the method and of course the method can also be applied in our field of quantum theory and if I get to it I will also be happy to tell you about this. But so my main point is about the method. So let, let me just um, state the problem first. So like one, one way to state a problem that can be solved by this method, it's not the most general problem, but a common one is the following. Um, we are given a polynomial and we would like to minimize it. So this, uh, throughout the talk, um, I will assume that all such expressions, all such functions are polynomials. So this is a polynomial, polynomial in uh, n variables. So x is basically just a vector of n real variables. It's, it's important that uh, we are considering polynomials over, over real, uh, over the, over, um, with real variables because we will talk about inequalities. So I think it's some, some inequality science. Um, and we are considering uh, optimizations over uh, certain sets which are, which are also determined by polynomial uh, inequalities, basically. So um, the sets that we will optimize over are called a semi-algebraic set. It's a, sometimes it's also called a basic semi-algebraic set. Semi-algebraic set. So a basic semi-algebraic set is any set that can be written in the way that it consists of those points that satisfy a bunch of polynomial inequalities. So we have a bunch of polynomial functions, g with index j, and they, they are required, so these are fixed, and we only consider those points where all these polynomials are positive. Um, a general semi-algebraic set would be a union of such things, and this, this can also be treated. So, um, um, so these are also polynomials. Um, um, also, uh, it, is, it is easy to see that one can also require some polynomials to, to, to actually vanish. So, because, I mean, um, because this inequality g of x is equal to zero is, is equivalent that we just consider the condition that g of x is bigger or equal than zero and minus g of x is smaller or equal than zero. So equality constraints are also allowed there. Um, the method, so, so this set is possibly, possibly a very nasty set. So it, it need not be convex. Um, it, it doesn't even need to be a connected set. Uh, disconnected. It can be can be a pretty arbitrary set. However, the method that I'm describing works best if this set is a compact set. Method works best best if k is compact. So, so in particular, it should be a, maybe a bounded set. The, the boundary region doesn't really matter because we are minimizing continuous functions, so this, this boundary is, is not really an issue. Um, for example, if we, if we know, if we know that, um, that the minimization of our, that the minimum of this minimization problem is contained in a, in a compact region around the origin, we could just add an, equality, an inequality here, for example. One can add the inequality g1 of x, defined to be some constant squared minus x squared. So if we anyway know that 
uh, that the maximum, that the norm of, of, the, of the optimal value is bounded by some number r, we could just at no cost add this constraint. This changes the set but doesn't change the minimum. And so it, it's a pretty generic setup. All right. So one example, just to make this a bit more concrete, you could think of is the following. And this is just any arbitrary uh, um, example. You could take the set K, which is the set of vectors x1, x2, in R2, that satisfy the constraint that uh, they should lie in a certain circle of radius 1, and maybe they should also lie in a different uh, distorted circle, a circle of order 4, like the norm ball of the 4 norm. So this is already a, a somewhat complicated set. It looks somehow like, it looks like a circle on this side, and it looks like a little bit like a distorted circle on that side. So this is a, I mean, it's a, it's a form described by fourth order per polynomials, pretty arbitrary. And as, as the problem, uh, one, so I will, I will call the optimal value p star. As the problem, one could consider the problem of, of optimizing some polynomial function over this set. I mean, I, I'm just writing down something to give you, to, to tell you a generic instance of the problem. Something like this can also be more than two variables. All right, so um, so this setup, this setup contains. So, what kind of problems are uh, contained in this very general setup? So, as I already said, it contains non-convex problems. The a general, uh, a general insight from, uh, from the theory of optimization is that convex problems, so problems where you try to minimize a convex function over a convex set, these are still kind of tractable. I mean, you can certify the solution, and these problems are at least numerically and also, I mean, in some ways, also analytically treatable. And, but, but this setup is more general than that. So in particular, general bounded quadratic quadratic problems. Um, it, a, a very interesting case which is contained in that set of our, oops, our um, discrete problems. So for example, 0, 1 <coughs> integer programming programming problems. So if you restrict your variables um, like each of the variables x1 to xn to be uh, contained in a finite set, this can be phrased in this language. For example, you could require that each of the variables satisfies that the square of the variable is equal to the variable. This would restrict your variables to be just zeros or ones, and many problems, for example, in graph theory can be phrased uh, as zero one integer pro problems, for example, is there a link between two vertices or is there not a link between two vertices? Um, yeah, so this, this can be done. It, it, it turns out that um, this, this method kind of generalizes an approximation scheme to, to graph optimization problems. So this is a method. The method that I'm going to describe is a systematic improvement Um, of, of the so-called Shore relaxation. Uh, to, for example, I mean max cut. There is a, given a graph of large densities, there's a question, um, how, how, um, how can you partition the graph into uh, two subsets such that you cut the maximum number of existing uh, um, edges? And this is an AP hard problem, but there is a well-known uh, linear matrix uh, relaxation to this, and the lowest order of the of the method that I'm going to describe is just this short relaxation, more or less. Um, 
Yeah. Of course, I mean, this setup also contains linear programming. If, all, if the optimization function and the constraints are just linear, uh, polynomial, so to say, um, then this is included. Um, one, can, one can have complex uh, variables. So this, this will be important for quantum theory. Any complex variable can be written as the real part plus i times the imaginary part. Um, and one, I mean, this method can, can also be used to do other things, for example, to solve equations. Equations. So you would like to know, uh, you would like to know what points x are the simultaneous roots of a bunch of polynomials. Then you just optimize uh, the zero polynomial over over this set, and you will find out whether the set is empty or whether the set is not empty. So this is basically the feasibility question. Feasibility problem. Um, right. Um, I may not have time to talk about the dual formulations of this problem, but uh, I mean asking whether a polynomial is positive on a set can be dually phrased as requiring that a certain probability measure on the set has some given moments, which is a, a problem that is considered a lot in functional analysis. So uh, the dual problem will be like the so-called moment problem. And this, this connects to uh, many, many areas in mathematics, functional analysis, for example. Right, and, and there are also connections to, to other areas. So, um, so this is a, a very general class of problems that uh, can be can be attacked with this method. What is this? Can SDP also be formulated in this way? I mean. So yes. Yes. Right. So yes. Yeah. I mean, you can formulate a positivity constraint for matrices as as uh, as the inequalities that all principal minors of the matrix are non-negative, but this is not an efficient way to translate the problem. I mean, the, the, the basic method would be to translate these problems into SDPs and then take SDP solvers which exist and which are somehow more generic than, than these problems and uh, solve solve the problem. So we will translate this into SDPs later. All right. So um, let me first talk before we translate it, these all these problems into into SDPs uh, or approximating by SDPs. Let me tell you about the basic mathematical ingredient which makes all of this possible. So so there, there are a very variety of such results from real algebraic geometry. And they are called positive Stellen sets. So, the English translation is like positive uh, locus and theorem. It tells you at which points polynomial can be positive. There are a variety of such results. Um, so, these are positivity, positivity. Certificate results, and uh, so so this area of mathematics is called real algebraic geometry. Real algebraic geometry. Algebraic geometry means that we're dealing with polynomials, and real algebraic geometry means that the underlying field, like the real numbers, has an, an uh, is ordered, so we can use inequalities and not just equalities. Um, and the basic theorem that, that uh, on which the results from today will be uh, based on is a theorem by Putinar. And this is, I mean, not that old. He came up with that result in 1993. There were a few forerunners, but this is just the best version. So the result reads like this. If this set K, or which we would like to optimize if this is compact and and then there is a technical condition there are various uh, variations of this technical condition one one of these variations is the following um, 
the set of x where our first constraint is positive. Um, this is already, may already be compact. It is compact. Well, I mean, if this is compact, then the set k is also compact. But one can replace these conditions by other sufficient conditions, by other sufficient technical conditions. So this is um, um, other. This is for the Archimedean condition. Archimedean condition. This is just the simplest one. If we know that our optimum lies in a certain uh, ball of radius r, then this is one, one possibility. And so if our set is compact and satisfies a technical condition, and if some polynomial is strictly bigger than zero, strictly bigger than zero on the set K, um, then this theorem guarantees that there exist um, SOS polynomials um, I will call them by I will explain what SOS polynomials are in a second I will call them u0 u1 up to uh, how many constraints do we have so let's say j goes from 1 up to r so for each constraint, we, we also have such a SOS polynomial um, such that such that our given polynomial p of x can be written as one of those SOS polynomials plus the sum j going from 1 to r over these SOS polynomials indexed by j times our constraint functions. All right, so this is the basic theorem. I'm going to call this by equation star. So what is an SOS polynomial? An SOS polynomial in n variables is just any polynomial um, u that can be written in the following way. It is a sum of squares. Um, uh, we have an index i that goes from 1 up to, I mean, there are some number of terms, any number of terms, and we have polynomials which are squared. Um, so any, this can be any polynomials. So SOS means sum of squares. Makes sense. This polynomial is a, is a sum of the squares of other polynomials. All right. So this theorem guarantees if a polynomial is po is strictly positive on a set, then we can write this polynomial as a linear combination of the constraints and SOS polynomials and add some other SOS polynomial. So let me let me make plausible why this may be true. <coughs> Um, so one, one thing is, is pretty easy to see, if p of x uh, can be written as the right hand side of this uh, equation star, right, so if p of x can be written in this way, then it is easy to see that p of x is at least non-negative uh, for all x in everyone see this? Because, I mean, these u polynomials are always non-negative because they are the square of some other polynomials. If you evaluate them at any point, you get a positive number. And if you evaluate these polynomials g, gj, on a point from k, then they are also positive because, I mean, the set k was defined to be the set of all x where these polynomials are positive. So, I mean, if, um, if your polynomial can be written in this way, then it is then it does not vanish on that set. So, so. Um, but you derive strictly larger than zero over there. Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll make a comment about this in a second. So, so this means that. So, the right hand side of uh, 
of this equation star is a positive, is a certificate that the polynomial is non-negative. So this is called sometimes a positivity certificate. It's a positivity certificate. can write your polynomial in this way, then you have a mathematical proof that your polynomial P of X is non-negative on the set. It's a, it's a mathematical uh, proof and not just a numerical uh, I mean, um, tool. So, so the, the reverse direction, the reverse direction of that arrow, this is not obvious. It's not obvious. Um, so in, in some cases, in some cases, cases uh, one actually needs that p of x is uh, strictly larger than zero and k. So there exist polynomials which uh, are non-negative on a set but cannot be written in this way. But generic poly polynomials actually can be written in this way, um, even even if they are just bigger or equal than zero. I, I'll tell you why this, this is not a problem if you try to do optimization in a second. So um, I, I, I won't show you the proof of this direction. It is, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it is a more complicated proof than using the Han Banach theorem or something like the, the separating hyperplane theorem because if you have just linear polynomials, so if this is a linear form and this is a linear form, then this a fact similar to this is called Falkas lemma in, in, in linear programming. If a linear form is, is positive on, on the set where some other linear forms are positive, all the GJs, then this linear form can be written as a linear combination of those forms. This is, this is the content of Falkas lemma, and this is something more general here. So, uh, it, it proof, so uh, the proof is a wide generalization of something called Falkas lemma, which is based on the separating hyperplane theorem in finite dimensions. Um, so, um, why do we need this Archimedean condition here? Um, so. Why Archimedean condition? Archimedean condition. So suppose that our Archimedean condition, that which is satisfied, is that the set defined by the first constraint is already compact. This means that there must be enough negative terms here. So, so this means that this polynomial G one which is, for example, 1 minus all components of x squared. So it means that this, this polynomial contains already enough uh, negative terms such that if you, if you uh, multiply this polynomial by SOS polynomials, there can be enough cancellations happens. There, there are enough minus signs to cancel, cancel terms from these here with terms from them. Right? It means that you have enough freedom to play around with these SOS polynomials and actually make them equal to your desired polynomial. So this here um, um, contains, contains enough, in quotation marks, negative terms, negative terms, or in, any of these other technical conditions also ensure this. So, so this will mean that um, Terms of high degree of high degree uh, on the right hand side of this uh, equation star can cancel. Right? So you have it guarantees that you have enough freedom to write a desired polynomial as such a linear polynomial combination, basically. Um, so 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 this already points to this already points to uh, I mean the main weak point of the method, which is however unavoidable. That so um, one can give no no 
uh, I mean, a priori at this stage of what we know, there are no bounds on the degree of these SOS polynomials, um, on the degree of these UJs. So what I want to say by this is, if you have a, if you have a, a problem like this here, where your um, objective function is of degree 6, and your constraints are of degree 2 and 4, it may be that um, some of these SOS polynomials that you have to use are of very huge degree. Right? Because, I mean, they may be of degree 1,000, all of them, and then you may have on the right-hand side terms of uh, where the monomials in the polynomials have degree 1,000, th but they may all cancel to give you your polynomial of degree 6, which you want to optimize. Right? So the certificate for positivity that you want to use in the optimization may be of large degree. Um, so when we, when we try to approximate this, uh, uh, this polynomial optimization problem, we will, we will put a bound on the degrees of these polynomials. So put a bound, put bound on these uh, for, the, for approximation purposes. So there, there, there are also other positivity theorems which are maybe formulated in terms of SOS polynomials or in terms of like some other nice polynomials which can also be used for similar purposes as what I'm doing, but I think this is somehow the most successful method, at, at least the most successful generic method to do this. All right, so how to formulate this as an SDP? If you don't know what an SDP is, this is a semi-definite program, and I will explain a little bit about it later on. So this is an optimization problem, which uh, is easier to solve in some way than this generic polynomial optimization problem that we are trying to deal with. So how can we formulate this problem as an SDP? Formulation. I think this was, in full generality, this was only realized relatively late, so around maybe 2001, I, I think. So Apparently, I mean, Shaw has done some, his work before, but this very general method is late. This was done by people like Lasser and Parillo. Independently of each other, I think. I think they didn't know about each other. So there, there, are, there are two steps. There's an easy step of how you, can, how you first reformulate the problem. So we would like to, to compute the optimal value, the minimum of the, of the polynomial P of x over all uh, points in, in a set K, which is described as above. So this is just the same as, so we have x, P of x, This is our function p, and we would like to find the global minimum of this function. What we do is we try to find the optimal uh, lower bound to this whole thing. So we try to maximize a number lambda. We take the maximum over all lambdas such that the polynomial p of x minus lambda, this is still a polynomial, is no negative 1k. So let's say k is this set here, and lambda is here. So we try to maximize the lower bound such that, I mean, we touch, we touch this polynomial function. So if we subtract lambda, it should still be positive or non-negative. Um, also, it doesn't really change. So if, if we do the following, we take the maximum over all lambda, and we just require that this thing here should be strictly positive. Then we, we, we are not allowed to write maximum any, anymore, but we can write supremum, because this set may not be I mean, a closed set over which we optimize, but uh, I mean, we can get, 
if we, if we require lambda to be strictly smaller than the global minimum, we still can, I mean, the best, the best uh, uh, zero or, or to be greater than zero, to require the polynomial to be greater than zero doesn't really cause any issues in the optimization. Um, right? So then we can write it like this. We take the supremum over all lambda such that p of x is a strictly positive polynomial on that set. So as we just learned, uh, we, any strictly positive polynomial can be written in, in the following form. It is an SOS polynomial in x plus a sum of SOS polynomials times the constraint functions. This goes from 1 to r, right? And now we make this smaller by, as I said, we, a priori we don't know a bound on the, on the degree of these SOS polynomials, but if we restrict the number of SOS polynomials to those of, of, uh, of degree d, for example, then we get a smaller, uh, a smaller value for the supremum. So and now the the, the number of, of SOS polynomials of a bounded degree can be parameterized efficiently. I will show you this in the next step, and then we can find a lower bound on the minimum of a polynomial. So, so, so this is the non-trivial direction. To find an upper bound on the minimum is easy because you can just evaluate the polynomial at some point x hat, and you have an upper bound on the minimum. So this is easy. But how how we, how you would get lower bounds on the minimum? on the global minimum of a polynomial, so this is, this is not easy to obtain. And the inequality goes in the right direction if we restrict um, um, the number of SOS polynomials we allow. So I will define this here as the optimal value uh, of the optimization if you restrict your SOS polynomials to have, to have degree d. What I mean by this, we should uh, restrict um, put, put some bound on the on the monomials that can appear. For example, degree bounds, but other bounds are also possible. Okay. How can we write this now into in an SDP form? D is so write this as a linear linear matrix inequality. Linear matrix inequality. So remember um, SOS, um, an SOS polynomial, let's say of degree d, I, I define this to be any polynomial that can be written as a sum of polynomials squared, where I put a degree bound on this here. So SOS polynomials with an index d have, have degree at most 2d. They can be written in, in this form. So we write, let me continue here. So we write, um, write the polynomial v. This, this can of course be written like this. It is a sum of coefficients. The coefficients that we have indices alpha times the first variable to an exponent alpha 1 plus times the second variable uh, to an exponent alpha 2 times the last variable to an uh, exponent alpha n. And the coefficient depends on I mean, which monomial term you have. I mean, this is a finite sum of, of these things. So we write such a polynomial that appears here. We, we identify it with a vector. We identify it with this vector of coefficients. And I will write this as v hat. So for example, the polynomial v of x could be something like 1 plus 2x plus 3y plus 0x squared plus 0xy plus 4y squared. I identify this with the vector um, 1, 2, 3, 0, 0, 4. And I mean, the, the, 
the ordering is determined by the, 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 the ordering of the monomials that I have here. I mean, obviously, I can, I can identify any polynomial in, in this way with a vector if I fix a, a basis of the, of, the, of the monomials. And then, um, then how, how would I represent the square of something like this? So then, um, the square of V of X is something like, um, we, we just multiply this polynomial by itself, so it's, it's something like 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2X plus 2x times 1 plus um, 1 times 3y plus 3y times 1. So we take, we multiply each term of v with each term of v. I mean, that's how we square polynomials. Um, so a good way to represent this is to represent this as a matrix. So we, ident we, uh, we identify this here with the matrix v hat. times uh, transpose v hat. So this would be the matrix uh, 1, 2, 3, 0, 0, 4, times 1, 2, 3, 0, 0, 4. This is equal to 1, 2, 3, 0, 0, 4, um, 2, 4, 6, 0, 0, um, 8, and so on. Right, so we find this term here, we find this term, um, one, for example, here, we find this term here, we find this term here. So the, the, the columns and the rows of this matrix are ordered by the same vector of monomials. Y, x squared, x, y, y squared. x squared, x, y, y squared, all right? And for example, um, in, this, in this whole sum, we have a term that reads like plus 17 y squared. How can the y squared arise? The y squared can arise by um, squaring this term or by multiplying the y squared term with a 1. So we have 9 squared plus 4 times 1 plus 1 times 4. So the y squared term can arise from, from this number 9 here, or from this number 4, or from this number 4. So the coefficient of the y squared term is just 4 plus 4 plus 9, which is 17. Right? So, um, um, whereas uh, each monomial term appears only once in the vector representation, uh, each monomial term appears several times in the matrix representation. So, for example, the y squared term is this entry, and this entry, and this entry, and they sum to 17, so the, the represented polynomial has, has a term 17 y squared. There are, there are uh, various ways to represent a polynomial by such a matrix representation, but the most important observation is that this here is a positive, no matter what the vector v is, this is a positive matrix, actually a positive matrix of rank 1. So the representing matrix that we obtain in this way, it's one, one matrix to represent this polynomial. This is a positive semi-definite matrix of rank 1. And then if you take a sum of such matrices, a sum of such matrices, then you get a positive semi-definite matrix of higher rank. So this is how to formulate the property of being an SOS polynomial with some monomial ordering as a linear matrix inequality. So the condition is just that, uh, and so, so, so it means that an SOS polynomial of degree d is, uh, corresponds to a matrix J, which is positive semi-definite. And this is a very nice constraint. Whereas this is hard to check, this is a nice constraint. I already used all of, my, all of the platforms. Done. So, restricting the, the degree of the V polynomial, so we're restricting how many terms can be in the sum as well? Sorry. No, I'm not restricting the number of terms in the sum. Okay. It, it turns out that you never need more terms in the sum than you have 
uh, monomials because I mean you, you need at least degree the degree of the matrix may be I mean the rank of the matrix may be four. Right? So you can always find an eigen decomposition and write it in this way. All right. Um, let me clean some parts of the So, so it can be, I mean, another way to say this is that uh, J is just required to be in, in the given um, uh, labeling of the rows and columns, it's, it's any matrix of that size which is positive semi definite. Remember, um, for this optimization problem, we would like to write the polynomial P minus lambda. Lambda was just a constant, a, a number. We would like to write as a SOS polynomial plus SOS polynomial times other polynomials. So, um, so to write P of x, we would like, to, for example, to write this as a SOS polynomial uh, of degree 4. So the uh, polynomials v have degree 2 plus, for example, a constraint function which looks like this g1 of x, y times an SOS polynomial. It turns out if, if this is already of degree uh, 4 at most, then it, it's sufficient to restrict the degree here. Right? So, what we do is we, we write, we identify this here with the matrix um, uh, that is uh, has up to represents po uh, polynomials with up to, uh, I mean, which represents SOS polynomials with base degree two, x squared, x y, y squared. So this is any positive semi-definite matrix J, which has entries J one comma one. J1, x, and so on, and the rows and columns are uh, indexed by those monomials. Plus this polynomial. So this is now a little bit of an abuse of notation. I mean, this is supposed to represent a polynomial in the way that I just outlined. Plus this constraint polynomial times uh, the representing matrix of any SOS polynomial with base degree 1. So the, the rows and columns would be in, in this is just by uh, 1, x, and y. So for example, the entries would be g11, g1x, g1y. So this, this, this matrix g is also a positive semi-definite, just like this matrix v. So our base variables are now these SOS polynomials and actually also our number lambda, which also enters in a, in a linear way. So this here is, for example, if, if you now multiply this polynomial plus the constraint times, times this polynomial, then you get a constant term, which is just the, the J11 entry. And how, you, how can you get a constant term from here? It's 1 times the G11 entry. Um, how can you, for example, get a term which reads like x squared y? Well, you can get it, for example, from multiplying this x squared with y. So this would be, for example, the j x squared comma y plus j y comma x squared. The matrix stays always symmetric, so this is always the same. Plus you get a bunch of other terms. But from the j matrix, for example, I mean j um, x y comma x, because x y times x also multiplies to this here. Um, and then, but you can also get uh, uh, monomials x squared times y from, from the last uh, term. So for example, by multiplying x squared times y, so we get a minus sign. Right. So, and 
what you want, you want to match the coefficients of this polynomial, which are given once lambda is fixed. You would like to match the coefficients with these polynomials with the coefficients in the in, in, in this form. So you would like to match. This here should be equal to the the constant term of p minus lambda. This coefficient here should equal the coefficient of the term x squared times y in, in the given polynomial, right? So you're looking for positive semi-definite matrices J and G, such that when you, when you form these combinations, they should match the coefficients of your given polynomial. So this means that um, in this example, in this example, we get something like um, the approximation of this uh, of this polynomial optimization problem to order two is the maximum over all lambda over all positive semi-definite matrices J of the appropriate size to represent the squares and all positive semi-definite matrices G of the appropriate size and if we have more constraints we have other matrices G as well and the constraints are that uh, so we maximize lambda and we want that um, the coefficients of the polynomial P minus lambda they should just match what we write here so this should be equal to the 1 1 entry of the matrix J plus 1 times the G 1 1 entry of the matrix G and for example the, the x squared times y coefficient uh, should, should match this term here should match this entry of the matrix J plus this entry of the matrix J plus some minus some other entries of the matrix G And then there are, I mean, for each for each uh, monom for each coefficient in that uh, polynomial, there is an equation, and then we also have the constraints that J should be a positive semi-definite matrix and G should also be positive semi-definite. All right. So this is a semi-definite optimization problem because we have just a f like in these variables we have semi-definite inequalities and also linear and affine inequalities. So, and solvers exist for this. Here. All right. So, if we if we allow if we allow monomials of higher order, so we get larger matrices. So we may allow as the base as the base uh, polynomials now polynomials of degree three, of degree four, and so on, then we get larger matrices. There may be more intricate cancellations happening between all the terms. So if we allow higher degree, we can represent more SOS polynomials in this way, which will make the maximum bigger, right? We get a bigger, S, a, a, a bigger value for the maximum, so we get a better lower estimate on this minimum. But the computational effort will grow because the size of the matrices grows as well. So this here is the so-called SDP relaxation of order d equals two. And as I said, as, as you grow d, um, you will you will get better approximations. Oftentimes it ha it happens. I mean, from what I read, and I also observed this, I will show you an example in a second, that if you, if you make d large enough, like maybe, let's say, d equal to 4, then you will have actually have exact, con then you will exactly reach the minimum, and you can detect this fact from looking at the ranks of the matrices. So if, you, if your approximation cannot improve further, then you, there are some uh, KKT conditions, like in uh, convex optimizations, which, which will tell you about this fact that you have actually reached the optimum. All right, uh, again, the drawback of this method is that the number of variables, the number of variables scales like the number of, 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 of your x variables, so the dimension of the optimization, to, to the power of two times the relaxation of order. So, I mean, the computational effort grows um, you, sometimes you can exploit sparsity of the matrices or do some clever tricks, but the generic method it works just like this. All right. Um, 
maybe before I finish, I would like to show you uh, an example of how simple this is to do in MATLAB. So this here is, a, is an example. I mean, there's a collection of such optimization problems against which you can benchmark your algorithm. Uh, the problem here is to, uh, it, 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 this example looks relatively simple, um, but I think they chose it because it has some interesting behavior. So we just want to, it's, it's an example where we have three variables, x, y, and z, so n is equal to three, and we would just like to, uh, I guess, minimize or maximize this linear function, could also be a quadratic function or anything like this, um, over a region that is determined by quadratic constraints. So we have a region uh, in R3 which is determined by the requirement that, that all of these uh, polynomials have to be non-negative. Right? So I mean, this region is relatively simple. Um, there's a quadratic polynomial which we require to be positive and then a bunch of linear constraints. So uh, here I have plotted this region. It doesn't look too complicated, but I think, again, this problem was chosen because it has some interesting behavior. Um, it is a non-convex non region. So this is the region over which we are going to optimize. Um, yeah, it's non-convex, but it's, and it's also only determined by quadratic constraints. All right, and we would like to, to, to optimize this function. And there is a package in, uh, in, in MATLAB which can do this. So this is how it looks like. Um, we have to initialize the package, basically. And then you, we define, so remember, um, MATLAB is, is a numerical computational package, but we define this problem in a symbolic way. This is, this, this is one functionality of this glob poly package, which I'm going to use. So we, we tell the, pro, the, the program what are the variables, and then we tell what is the objective polynomial, which we would like to minimize. And we, we, we will tell this, this uh, program what the constraints are. So the constraints are exactly these eight equations which I've shown you, I mean, which are, which are shown also here, which this picture represents. And then, so what we are going to do is, we are going to uh, define the region over which we are, we are maximizing. So this is the region defined by requiring that all of these eight polynomials are uh, non-negative. And here we can just enter the, the, the relaxation order. So this d is the degree of the polynomials v, or let's say 2 times d is the maximum degree of the right-hand side of this Putina certificate. And um, we can also then tell this package to uh, make out of this polynomial optimization data an SDP like the SDP of relaxation order D. So we want to minimize this function under these constraints, constraints given by this here, relaxation order one. So uh, let me run this. Um, sample two. So um, what this has done, it, uh, here it shows the objective function. Here it shows that we have a, a the constraints are, are given by these functions, and it has now created an SDP formulation of our problem. Um, the SDP formulation is relatively small, so the number of, of decision variables is 9. Um, this makes sense because, I mean, we have all terms up to quadratic terms in, uh, in three variables. There are exactly 9 terms like this. There are eight inequality constraints, and the biggest linear matrix inequality size is a 4 by 4 size. And so, um, how can I go back with this? Um, ah, yeah, here. So, and now we can solve it. And so the, the, next, the next step here, this this MSDP, uh, no, this was the wrong one. Um, this this uh, msol command will now just call an SDP solver to solve this problem. So let's watch how, how it works. Um, it's this here. And now the output of, I mean, how the SDP solver works, it, it has now taken in this problem that we have defined before 
and it, it called a solver. This is like an interior point solver. It took nine iterations to get an, uh, an accuracy of like 10 to the minus nine. And uh, the, the lower bound on this minimum that was found was minus six. And now we can like step, uh, just improve, improve uh, the accuracy by going to a higher uh, relaxation order. So, so the optimal value that we found here was, was a minus six, and the optimal value that we find at the second approximation uh, is, takes a little bit longer, minus 5.6. Then we go one order higher. Um, we get a value of a little bit worse than minus 4.0. And if we now go to the fourth order of the relaxation, um, here, it, it, we, get a, we get a lower bound on the minimum of minus four, and the status flag is now set to one, which means that these KKD conditions are satisfied, meaning that we have actually reached the, 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 the absolute minimum. And it tells you at which point, point this minimum is. So, um, I would like to emphasize that this is not just a numerical method, it is really a kind of can be used as a proof tool because all these lower bounds can be certified. I mean, this, this program outputs you these SOS polynomials, which can be used in a proof uh, that, that, a poly that the minimum of the global minimum of some polynomial is larger than this or that value. Right? And the same, I mean, so, so it's, it's not just a numerical method, it's really a proof tool. The same method can be used to certify that a state contains entanglement, right? So, um, the, the, so I, I'm looking at a, sp a specific class of states, and I'm trying to maximize the, the contribution of that state within, so I tr I'm trying to write the state as a convex combination of some state plus a separable state, and I try to maximize the the, the convex contribution, if the convex contribution is, is, is equal to 1, so then the state is separable. If, if it's not equal to 1, then, then it's not separable. And I mean, this is done by, by such a program. You, you try to maximize the trace of the, of the separable part by, by some um, inequalities. And, but this is just one application of, of, this, of this very general method of, of optimizing polynomial optimization problems. Um, this is, I think this method is different than the method of um, of this DPS hierarchy that was also devised to, to certify the entanglement in, in states. It, it, I mean, the general idea is similar, but but the specific po positivity certificates are, are different than the Putina certificates that I've given to you. Uh, I, I think the, the relation between those things has not been clarified exactly, so this would be something interesting also to do. Yeah, so I think that's the main point of what I wanted to, to convey to you. Yeah.